In today's video, we will take a look on how the Next.js caching is evolving. And how are we going to do that? Well, we will dive into this blog post by Sebastian Markboke and see what's coming in the upcoming versions of Next.js. So one of the biggest changes to caching with Next.js 15 was that uh, get route handlers and uh, client router cache are no longer cached by default, but you have to opt in for caching for those. And Versal also introduced us some other changes that they are going to be making and that are currently available in the Canary version of Next.js. Uh, so they are still quite experimental. But in this blog post, uh, Sebastian goes through the changes that are coming and some of the exper experimental things that you can already experiment with, but are not yet stable. So let's take a look on those. Okay, so front-end performance can be hard to get right, even highly optimized apps. The most common culprit by far is the client-server waterfalls. When introducing Next.js app router, we knew that we want to solve this issue. To do that, we needed to move client-server REST fetches to the server using React server components in a single round trip. This meant the server had sometimes to be dynamic, sacrificing the great initial loading performance of Jamstack. We built partial pre-rendering to solve this trade-off and have the best of both worlds. However, along the way, the developer experience suffered due to caching defaults and controls we provided. The default for fetch changed to favor performance by caching by default, but quickly prototyping and highly dynamic apps suffered. We didn't provide enough control over local database access that wasn't using fetch. We had unstable cache, but it wasn't ergonomic. This led to the need for segment level configs such as export const dynamic runtime fetch cache dynamic params and revalidate as an escape hatch. We'll continue supporting that for backwards compatibility, of course, but for a moment, I'd like you to forget all about that. We think we have an idea for something simpler. We've been cooking on a new experimental mode that builds on just two concepts, suspense and use cache. Okay, so basically they're saying here that all the things we learned about caching in Next.js 14, we should just forget all about that. And they are saying that these two concepts are something we should actually concentrate on. Okay, so let's see how they work. So first thing you'll notice is that when you add data to your components, you will now get an error. So here we have an example. So if we have an asynchronous component that fetches some data and we are adding it to a page, we are getting an error. To use data, cookies, headers, current time or random values, you now have a choice. Do you want the data to be cached, server or client side, or executed on every request? I'm using fetch as an example, but this applies to any async node API, such as databases or timers. So using asynchronous uh, APIs such as fetch uh, in the upcoming versions will throw an error. And let's actually try this out. So as said, this is still experimental and you probably shouldn't use this in your production applications, but this is something that we can play around with and this will probably be introduced in the future versions of Next.js. So it's good to test it out and understand how it works. So in order to test this, we need to use the Canary version of Next.js. And if we scroll down, they're saying here that in order to play with this, you must be on Canary version of Next.js and also enable the experimental dynamic IO flag in Next.config.ts. So looks like there is actually a typo here. It should be Canary instead of latest. So let's make sure that we install the Canary. But yeah, Let's actually test this out. So I'm going to copy this and open up my terminal and paste it in and change the latest to canary and say it cache testing like this. Okay. And once that's run, let's open it up in VS Code like this. So now we are on the canary version, as we can see over here. And one other thing we needed to do was to modify the next config. So I'm just going to copy it from here, open up my next config and select all paste in. So we have the dynamic IO enabled. All right. So let's fire up the dev server and open up our local host 
Okay, so our app is running. So let's switch back to the blog post and I'm just gonna scroll back up over here. So yeah, let's test this out. Do we get an error for using this asynchronous component in our page? So the way I'm gonna test it out is by using fetch. So let's switch back to the VS code and I'm gonna actually create a new route for us called users like this and add some code over here like this. So we are just printing header and then a user list component and we don't yet have that component. So let's create that. And I'm gonna add some code inside of it like this. So what I'm doing here is defining a function get user that is asynchronous and it's fetching some user data from an API and then just returning it. And inside of our user list component, we are getting the users with that function. And this is of course awaiting that function and this whole component is asynchronous. And then we loop through the users and display them as a list. All right, so now let's switch back to the page file. Let's save it and switch back to the browser. And I'm gonna open up the slash users route like this. And we can see we get our users displayed over here and we get an error down here. So as the blog post suggested. So let's actually switch back to the blog post and see what it says next. So if you are still iterating or building a highly dynamic dashboard, you can wrap the component in a suspense boundary. Suspense, suspense opts into dynamic data fetching and streaming. So if we wanna get rid of that error, we can wrap the component inside of a suspense boundary. Uh, you can also do this in your root layout or use loading TSX. This ensures that the shell of your app remains instant. You can continue adding more data inside your page, knowing it will all be dynamic by default. Nothing is cached by default and no more hidden caches. So this looks really simple and straightforward. So let's try it out. So I'm gonna switch back to the browser and actually I'm gonna click this error open and see what it says. Uh, slash users, a component access data, headers, params, search params, or short-lived cache without suspense boundary or use cache above it. So the error message here also indicates that we can get rid of this error by using suspense boundary. So let's try it out. Open our VS code. And what we wanna do is wrap the user list component, which is responsible for fetching that data. Uh, and we wanna wrap it inside of a suspense boundary like this. And let's import the suspense like this. So let's save it and switch back to the browser. If we refresh the page, we can see we no longer get the error and the shell of the application, so this user's page is rendered as a static route, as it says over here, but we are getting the dynamic data inside of it because we wrapped the user list inside of a suspense boundary. So every time we are refreshing this page, we are actually also making the fetch request and hitting that API endpoint because there is no longer any hidden caching happening behind the scenes. All right, so let's see what the blog post says next. If you are building something static and don't want to use dynamic functionality, you can use the new use cache directive. By marking the page with use cache, you are indicating that the entire segment should be cached. This means any data you fetch can now be cached, allowing the page to be statically rendered. No suspense boundary is used for static content. You can add more data to the page and it will all be cached. So by marking the page with uh, use cache, we can opt in the caching for the whole page. So let's try that out. So I'm gonna switch to the VS code. And first I'm gonna get rid of the suspense boundaries because as said, uh, we don't need them if we want to have this whole page static. I'm gonna save it and let's actually see the browser. Yep, we are getting the error again that we got earlier. So now let's add the use cache up here like this. So I'm marking this user's page to be cached. So let's save it, see the browser and we get an error. So looks like whenever we use the use cache we need to also be using the asynchronous function. So to fix this, and by the way, 
I'm loving this error message showing the component with these arrows. I know it's a small thing, but boy, does it look cleaner. But yeah, so what we want to do is mark this as a sync like this. So let's try it again, save it and see what we get. Okay, so now we don't have the error anymore. And this is something you should note is that now that you refresh the page, it's getting the users from cache and not hitting the API endpoint every time you refresh. Compared to the last scenario where we didn't use the use cache directive, but rather use the suspense boundary. So back then it hit the API endpoint every time we refresh the page. But now this whole segment is cached, meaning that this page is static and also the user list is static because this fetch request or the data from it is cached. Okay, let's see the blog post again. So you can also mix and match. For example, you can put use cache in your root layout to ensure it is cached. Each layout or page can be cached independently. So we can mark the layout with the use cache. So this layout will be using caching and then fetch some data in it and display it alongside with the children. And in the children, we can have a page that uses dynamic data by wrapping the component inside of a suspense boundary. So right now, this data over here in the layout is cached and this data inside of the component is fetched on every request because it's wrap, wrapped inside of the suspense boundary. Okay, then we have something called cached functions. So when using a hybrid approach like this, it might be more convenient at caching closer to the API calls. You can add use cache to any async function, just like use server. Think of it as a server action, but instead of calling a server, you are calling a cache. It supports the same rich types of arguments and return values beyond just JSON. The cache key automatically includes any arguments and closures so you don't need to specify a cache key manually. Okay, so looks like we can put the use cache inside of our function that's responsible for fetching the data. And this way we don't need to mark the whole layout or page or component as to be cached. So since no other data was used in this layout, it can remain static. A benefit of this approach is that if you accidentally add new dynamic data to the layout, it will trigger an error during the build, forcing you to make a new choice. If you add use cache to the entire layout, it will be cached with no error. Which approach you choose depends on your use case. So basically, if we want to cache this data right now, and uh, later on, if we added some other data over here, and we wanted it to be dynamic, by using the use cache inside of the function, we are just marking this function to be cached. But if we used it as up here, like this, and the new piece of data that we wanted to display here would automatically also be cached. And if that's something we don't want, if we wanted it to be dynamic, in that case, it's good to mark the function as cached instead of the whole layout. So let's actually try out that caching for the function. So right now, I have the page using the use cache. So I'm gonna take that off and save this. And in the browser, we can see we again get the error as expected. So now let's add the use cache just for this get users function. Like this, and let's save it. And switch to the browser and we get rid of the error. So right now, the function is cached, so this data over here is coming from a cache, and whenever we refresh the page, it's not hitting the uh, API for the users, but rather hitting the cache to get the users. So this way, we don't have to mark the whole component uh, to be cached, but we can only define that, hey, we want this function to be cached. So that's pretty cool. Let's switch back to the blog post and see what else they are saying over here. Uh, if you want to explicitly clear a cache entry by tag, you can use the new cache tag API inside the use cache function. So it looks like we can get the cache, cache tag from the next cache and then mark the cache with desired tag. Then just call revalidate tag from a server action 
as before. Since this API can be called after data loading, you can now use data to tag your cache entries. So that's actually pretty cool. So in this example, we are getting blog posts for a page and we are caching the request. So we are fetching posts and then looping through the posts and actually caching uh, each post by their ID or using the post ID in the cache tag. So that's pretty cool. And then we have some changes for the lifetime of the cache. If you want to control how long a particular entry or page should live in the cache, you can use the cache life API. So we can again get the cache life from the next cache and then set the cache life like this. So by default, it accepts the following value, second minutes, hours, days, weeks, max. Choose a rough range that best fits your use case. No need to specify an exact number and calculate how many seconds or was it milliseconds are in a week. However, you can also specify specific values or configure your own named cache profiles. In addition to revalidate, this API can control the stale time of the client cache as well as expire, which dictates when a page should expire if it hasn't had much traffic for a while. So this looks really interesting. And one thing I actually like about this cache life is the fact that you can uh, give the parameter as minutes or hours or days. So what this means is that you no longer have to provide an exact value on how long the cache is valid, but rather just say seconds, so it will be a shorter time. But if you know that this cache can live for days, then you can just use the days. And you don't, as they are saying here, or was it milliseconds? Yeah, you never remember is it seconds or milliseconds. And then if you want, to, want it to be a week, you have to cal calculate on how many milliseconds is in a week and so on. So this just, uh, I think, improves the developer experience a lot. And again, this is still very much experimental project and it's not production ready yet. So you can use it by using the Canary version so you can test it out and give your feedback. But for production, it's not ready yet. Overall, I think this new direction that uh, Virtual is going with the Next.js caching is better because it feels much more simpler and straightforward and something that you don't have to always think about how the caching works or remember to add those parameters for your fetch requests if you don't want to cache. So I think this is really good that the caching is opt-in and you can control it with the suspense boundaries and the use cache direct. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how this project develops and where it will, will end up. I really hope you found this video at least somewhat helpful. And if you did, I think you might also enjoy my exclusive newsletter. In the newsletter, I share more in-depth Next.js and web development content that I don't talk about anywhere else. And I also have exclusive Q&A sessions just for the newsletter subscribers. So if that sounds something you might be interested in, be sure to sign up for that newsletter from the link in the description.